Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this Silicon Moral Education Initiative event. I'm one of the co conveners of the Silicon Moral Education Initiative, the other one being Joe Levinson. And mm -hmm. um, we just said in the debaters who don't know, we are a, a regular uh, colloquium or seminar series about every two weeks, which looks at cutting edge, provocative, exciting, current issues in civic education, civic engagement, moral education, moral issues generally. Uh, and we have a very large mailing list, over 700 people, so it's a very wide audience. And we welcome all of you to join our list. In fact, we're going to hand round a sign-up sheet. We'd love you to sign up with your email address so that you can come to future events. This afternoon is really exciting because we're taking a very topical, uh, a topical topic, topical topic, a current <laughs> exciting topic, very much in the news. And we have people from Brandeis and Harvard Law School. The event will be moderated by Professor Julie Rubin, who has done an exciting, extremely interesting and important work on uh, higher education, civic education, and um, activism in her, in her career. So welcome, Julie, and welcome to us. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here, and particularly thank you to uh, the panelists. As a historian of higher education, I know that students have been protesting as long as there have been colleges and universities. They have spoken or acted against practices that they found unfair or oppressive and sometimes just simply annoying. <laughs> Through time, and even today, most protests received little notice. Sometimes only the students who protested really felt the impact of their actions. Other times, there were ripples through the institution. Sometimes the protesters were punished. Sometimes they were expelled and banned from the community. Sometimes protesters successfully forced changes in the schools that they attended. And occasionally, protests coalesced, coalesced into movements. Movements felt through the institution, across institutions, and outside institutions, and even across the globe. In these times, student protests have had profound impact on higher education and on society. Perhaps we are in one of those moments. Tonight, we're going to hear from five student activists involved in protests at Brandeis University and Harvard Law School. These protests are um, two schools among many across the nation that have been engaging in protests linked to the Black Lives Matter movement. The most direct historical antecedent of these protests are the wave of protests led by black students in the wake of Martin Luther King's assassination in April 1968. Influenced by the civil rights movement, but sickened by the virulent racism unleashed in response to that movement, and frustrated by the slow pace of change, many black college students in 1968 yes. identified with the black power movement. These students led forceful protests occupying buildings and shutting down campuses. They issued lists of non-negotiable demands. Some of these demands included increasing the percentage of black students enrolled, creating black housing for students who wanted to live together, creating black cultural centers, establishing black studies programs, hiring black faculty, and even hiring black faculty who didn't get prepared through graduate studies, but instead through their community leadership. Some of these students' demands were met. But through the 70s and 1980s, as the movement lost steam, many colleges and universities responded by rolling back on those changes. And through the 70s and 80s, a lot of black student activism was all directed at trying to preserve what had been established in 1968. And often, sadly, although not everything was lost, and if we think about our institutions today, 
we could see many, many aspects of our institution that were influenced by those black-led protests in 1968. But sadly, the vision, the vision of ending racism and creating a racially just institution, as we know, did not fully succeed. So from this vantage point of 50, almost 50 years later, we can see a connection between the protests that are going on today and the protests that happened in the past. We can see ways in which protesters are unfortunately having to go back and try to seek things that seemed like they were in place but didn't fully take root. And we also see ways in which protesters are actually building on the successes of earlier protests. So I'm really honored to be part of this panel and to learn more from these five activists about what's happening on their campuses and the types of responses that they've been getting and try to understand more about how they see their activities in relationship to other movements for change. We're going to begin by having each of the panelists introduce themselves. And then um, Christian will catch us up on what's happened at Brandeis, just give us a sense of the protests there. And Derricka will do the same for the Harvard Law School. Then I'll be asking some questions, we'll be having a discussion, and then we'll be opening it up for you all to join in the discussion. So do you mind starting us off with introductions? Not at all, not at all. Uh, my name is AJ Claiborne. Um, I'm uh, 3L at Harvard Law School, third year law student um, from Maryland. Uh, I went to Maryland University for undergrad um, and went straight to Harvard Law School. And I, uh, my the story of my like intellectual experience throughout higher education has been that I have become more and more uh, leftist as I have gone throughout as I've learned things. Uh, I think you can draw a pretty good correlation between knowledge and leftism. Uh, in any case, uh, the tipping point for me really was uh, last was last year um, during the Freddie Gray incident um, because I think and I think I think, the, I think the reason for that is because I um, that was my backyard that was Baltimore that's where I I worked this my one L summer there um, and it really just impacted me in a way uh, that's difficult for me to describe um, so when I came back to campus uh, this fall um, I sought to get involved in activism in whatever way I could and uh, here I am now. Okay, so this is awkward because you guys have been hearing my son sort of like turn up. <laughs> um, but I haven't seen them for like a month and so I won't let them leave my sight. Um, so shout out to my husband and my, hu my son who keeps calling me Bay. <laughs> so that's what's happening. He's down before anything else. So, um, yes, I love you too. Okay, so my name's Derica. I'm a second year student at the law school. I'm from St. Louis. Um, before I'm a student activist, I'm an organizer. So I'm an organizer who just happens to be in law school right now. Um, the, the summer before I started law school, about three weeks, Michael Brown was killed about four blocks from where I, where I live. Um, and so my husband and I were in the streets, we were organizing, we were a part of the Ferguson Uprising right before I went to a school that basically upholds the system of oppression that led to the uprising in the first place. Um, I wouldn't say that was, that was when I became radicalized. Um, my mama is like real, real radical. So I grew up in a very activist um, space. Um, the first time I engaged in student activism, I was actually a high school student. And we took over the mayor's office because they wanted to um, take away our school's accreditation. We were like, hell no, right? <laughs> so me and a bunch of other high school students, um, that was our introduction to organizing. And from that, I've organized in several capacities. Most of them have been in education or around criminal justice. Um, and I was like, you know what? If we could just change the law, if we could just, you know, have the right sort of policy, I think that we can alleviate some of the oppression that we see from marginalized communities. 
And then I got to law school, and I was like, no. Like, the answer is definitely not in the law. The answer is definitely not in policy. The answer is in people, and people being tired. And we saw that in Baltimore. We saw that in Ferguson. We're seeing that in Johannesburg right now. We're seeing that in Amsterdam right now. We see people are tired, and that sort of um, energy coming from their fatigue is creating an awakening across the world. And I'm just really happy to be born right now. So I'm really excited to, to be in dialogue with panelists and with you guys here tonight. Um, my name is Rima Jodri. I'm a public policy student at the Heller School at Brandeis University. I'm studying poverty alleviation, um, you know, with the same intention as Derek has spoke about, trying to find uh, solutions within the system to transform the system from the inside out. Um, I'm from the Bay Area, California, Oakland. Uh, shout out to Oakland. Uh, um, and from a really early age, I was exposed to activism as well. Um, I think ever since I was about 12 or 13 years old, I had Black Panther, um, former Black Panther members who were part of the community who mentored myself and the, the local youth and instilled in us a very, in a, at a very early age the responsibility we had to the community, um, especially coming from an immigrant refugee family, um, there was this instilling of this immense privilege that I had while being a person of color, still being an American-born person who had um, this American-born right, so to speak, to stand up and push back as early and often as I can. Um, and I was really fortunate to have that sort of framing at a really early age, and it helped me from also a very early age to um, look at the systems around me and question them constantly. Um, so similar to what Derek spoke about as well, we need to talk offline, I already love you. Um, <laughs> at uh, about like 16 years old, there was a proposition, uh, Prop 21, that came out that was um, um, going to be charging youth as adults, that was the proposition, and so um, there was a lot of student organizing that was taking place and I was involved in that on my high school campus and that was just been that's been my trajectory ever since working to uplift low-income communities of color and low-income youth of color how we can get our voices represented from a grassroots level to a grass top level um, from day one I should I can say easily from day one and Christian will speak about this more um, I was extremely disenchanted and disappointed with my yeah. grad school experience um, and realizing that um, policy may not be the solution, but having radical thinkers within the policy world who can bridge in those gaps between radical organizing and systems change um, is still something that I want to work through and something that I may not be getting through my grad school experience directly, but again, weeding through the system and finding our, finding my place in it and finding that nexus has been really important to me and so I'm getting there. So I'm about to graduate in May, so. Okay, my name is Alexandria Alex Fischer. Um I'm from Atlanta um, and so my experience is like a little different than everyone's. I didn't grow up in an activist family. Um, I went, my high school, middle school education was all white. I was one of two people of color in my graduating class in high school. I then went to a PWI for my undergrad. And so what I learned is that I needed to work the system. I never challenged the system. I was like, well, I'm a person of color, I'm a woman, and I feel ostracized, but at the end of the day, I'm gonna make it. And that was it. And so I then was like, well, I'm tired of living and working the system, so I'm going to go and work abroad. So I went to Uganda. A lot of my advocacy work is in East Africa amongst like gender development issues. And so I lived in Uganda, then went to Rwanda, worked there um, for a women's development program, and specifically into domestic violence. And then I came back to the States, which is in like May 2015. Um, and I kind of like didn't like living in America, to be honest. I really hated living here. I hated our system. Um, and so the first two months, I kind of found myself stuck in my house. And then I decided to go to Ferguson for the one-year anniversary. Um, and 
such a small world. She organized everything that happened oh, in Ferguson. Everything. Well, she said she had organized some stuff that happened in Ferguson, in particular this concert that I had went to, and it was my first time being in an all-black space since I had come back to America, since I left Rwanda. And that was such an empowering experience. Like, I had never felt anything like that before, just being amongst people and chanting and saying, like, I have power. Like, that was meant so much to me. And so since then, I was like, you know what? You have to change the system here before you can go back to work for someone else that isn't, like, they're my brothers and sisters, but these are your brothers and sisters here as well. So how do I get engaged and work with you know, beautiful people like Rima and Christian. And so then Ferguson led me to some activism on campus at Heller, and they created these spaces for me to be involved and just really involved as self and critiquing self. Um, and so that's what led me to student activism. But yeah. Good afternoon, good evening, rather. Um, my name is Christian Perry. I'm originally from PG County, Maryland. Uh, where are you from, sorry? Um, I'm from Glendale, like the Largo area. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. My, da my dad grew up in uh, Glenarden. Nice, that's yeah. what's up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it was Glenarden, so you know, that's cool. Um, um, many people don't know PG County, so it's like a thing. Um, where was I? So, <laughs> I went to, yes, PG County. Um, I went to Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, which is a historically black college, um, all male. Uh, and I'm going to just fast forward to 2012 when I left the United States to start my Peace Corps um, stint in Lesotho, Africa, which is a very small um, country that's landlocked um, inside of South Africa. And I'm starting there because for me, that's where everything kind of starts to change. Um, a year into my service, uh, I, had, I had many different projects going on, but one that was particularly near and dear to me was my work with um, young African, young Basutu girls in high school. We had an HIV AIDS club, um, and we were just basically in conversation um, uh, about a host of different things. And after a year of doing work, one of the, one of the lead um, girls kind of disappeared. Um, and I remember talking to some of the other young girls being like, you know, where did she go? Um, and, sh and they were like, in Tati Tsapang, she's been married off. And so I'm walking back home that day that I find that out, and she's 14, 15. It, it's really happening every day. Um, and I, I remember going through like this kind of rage against the culture, the Basutu culture, um, that had like taken this young black girl away. And then something happened and I started to think about my nieces. Um, at the time, one was 10 and the other one was uh, four. And I started to think about their experience in the United States as young black girls. And then I started to think about my sisters and my mom and my, my host of female friends um, the Spelman women I had come into contact with, and that was the first time I had this realization that Christian, one, how dare you, um, begin to critique someone else's culture about their treatment of women, um, and you haven't once your entire life even asked or self-critiqued the way in which you oppress black women every single day. And so for me, that's where it started, um, and I'm the lucky one because I think that it's a very difficult thing to go through a, a transformation like this where you gain a self-awareness that allows you to self-critique yourself um, to the point where there's a shift, a fundamental shift. Um, and I say I'm lucky because I was on a mountain mm. technically by myself, right? This kind of idealistic storybook of you're alone, you hear voices, I wasn't, but you know, those types of things. And I really had time to work on myself. So I came back, um, and I, I think I'll just go into the story yep. of Brandeis. Okay. I, I came back um, from Peace Corps uh, in 2014 and started uh, with, at Heller, at the 
for a uh, master's in sustainable national development alongside REMA. Um, and we went into our orientation. And our orientation happened, and one of the sessions they separated the um, international students and the American students. And they started off the orientation with, as Americans, you all have privilege. And when you go abroad, you like, that's why you have such a hard time, because you're all American and you all have privilege. And for me, it was so unsettling, because I'm sitting in a room that's predominantly white. Um, I am the, I am, from, from what I can tell, the only self-identifying black African-American male who has had the lived experience of a black African-American male in the room. There's one uh, Mexican-American in the room. There is a woman who identifies as Muslim-American. Right, so there's, there's these pockets, one or two, three minority students. There's some transgender students in the room. And this professor had the audacity to blanket our entire experience as privileged. And did I, did I say that correctly? Um, and that kind of started this rippling effect. And fast forwarding us once again to November 19th, 2015, uh, Mizzou, the, uh, the week before, the week before November 19th, Mizzou had put out a call to college campuses all across the country to, to stand in solidarity with them. And uh, myself and a few of uh, Brandesians uh, here in the room today, uh, <laughs> along with several hundred other students gathered at the RAV steps, which, which has become our kind of meeting place. Um, and we stood in solidarity with, with Mizzou and we rallied and we walked, we marched down the campus. And that day, we considered Walk, marching and, and rallying in front of the president's office, but we found out that she was not there. So we ended up taking over the student center at Brandeis' campus, um, and we sat there for about three or four hours, um, at least took over that space and just had a speak out. Um, and that's where we met a lot of our comrades that would later become the people who we set in for 12 days the following week. So effectively, seven days later, we had met, we had been having meetings, and we sent out our list of demands on the 19th of November at one or two o'clock, and we gave them 24 hours to meet them. And we said that the entire campus could meet us on the RAB steps at two o'clock on November 20th, and it would either be a celebration or it wouldn't be. And we marched down um, from RAB steps, we rallied, uh, interim President Lynch was there, and we there there was nothing, and so we started moving um, with several hundred students. And I remember it always start the story off like this: we we walk into the president's office. It's this narrow corridor, and it's completely packed. And Rima, she goes, "This is a sit-in, y'all. Sit down." <laughs> And in my head, I'm going, oh, I guess we're not moving then. And we sit down, um, and I'm going to tie in another thing that I think I'm hoping that the other panelists can add on to. For me, our lives are constantly looking for purpose. And um, a lot of times, we're told to like put our purpose out there, you know, speak your purpose into existence. And we forget that when it shows up, that you have to be willing to take that final step. And for me, the past, since 2012, when I left Lesotho, there have been constant instances where God has been like, this is the purpose you have been asking me for. And it's been up to me to take that step. And again, Rima said, it's time to have a sit-in. And that was my opportunity to step away, right? That was everyone's opportunity to step away. And for those of us who decided to stay, that's what happened. Um, and for 12 days, I'll try to move quickly. Um, and for 12 days, uh, we had negotiations going on. And um, we had anywhere from 75 to 100 students during the entire period <coughs> that lived on the space. Um, our lowest period was during the Thanksgiving 
time frame, like the day before and like the day, two days after, where, um, where we kind of dropped below 75. Uh, but for the most part, we maintain those numbers. And we had an outpouring of support that was both monetary and in-kind donations, where we effectively kind of had a food bank, which we later ended up donating um, to the local uh, shelters in Waltham, correct, Dave? Yeah. Um, that we ended up donating to the local shelters um, in the area. And yeah, I mean, I guess we can, we can get into different parts, but the three of us kind of represent organizationally different parts of what happened over those 12 days. Rima from the negotiation side and um, Alex and myself from inside what was going on. Um, and hopefully we can, we'll have some opportunity to speak to how that happened. I, I hope that will. That's how I got it here. Okay. Uh, sure, yeah, uh, quickly. Okay, so uh, so raise your hand if you know about the black tape incident at Harvard. Of course you do. Okay, put your hands down. Okay, so raise your hand if you know about the meeting that took place on March 4th, 2012. No, no. Nobody knows about that meeting, right? Because that meeting is not going to get coverage. So people assume that our student movement started with some, like, tape, which is, like, sort of ridiculous because black tape, that wasn't the first instance of, like, overt racism at the law school, but that's one that gets media coverage, right? Um, so there's always been some sort of student movement, student resistance going on at the school. The year before, oh, that's just, just last year, uh, when I started, I know I was a part of a couple of different student organizations who were really upset about the school's silence on the Ferguson-related issues, Baltimore-related issues, Black Lives Matter movement generally. You know, if someone would get killed, there would be a hashtag, or we would go to class the next day and pretend like nothing ever happened. Um, so there were a number of students who were really, really disappointed that at a place that calls itself a justice school, right? This is a justice school. We're not merely a law school. Like, we're a justice school. We're a school with a mission to advance a particular set of politics and ideas. Um, so a lot of students were just like, you're lying. Like, clearly you're lying. Um, so we organized a, a couple of different, I don't, I don't know if I should put that out there because this, this was a tactic. But basically, we organized um, several groups to um, put pressure on our administration and put, to put pressure on different professors to have these conversations um, on campus to create classes that would speak to the issues that we saw in the street. Uh, a lot of us really wanted contextualized legal education. And so if we are reading about a case, um, we don't know, you know the race of the plaintiffs or the defendants. We don't know how you know their socioeconomic statuses affected them, um, affect the outcome of the case. A lot of professors would just teach a case and just leave some of those things absent. And then we would go back and do research and be like, yo, this is why that person got off, because it was an all white jury. Like, how are you in justice school and forget to mention there's an all white jury with two black defendants and no evidence? Like, it's kind of important, right? Um, so students begin, again, to, con to looking for ways to put pressure on the administration to respond to the bigger external movement that was going on around us. And then to take a critical look at a lot of the classes that were being taught, a lot of the programs um, that were being offered, who were the professors that were coming in to teach. Um, you know, if we look at the, the wins of prior Harvard Law activists, um, movement, we saw that students really lobbied for more professors of color. And so it's like, hey, we got seven more black faces. Like, check that off the box. But if you're hiring black professors who don't have black t politics, or if you're ha hiring black professors who are not critical of the legal system, mm -hmm. then you're not really hiring black professors. You're hiring, you're engaging in a form of identity politics that's doing a disservice to this institution. Mm -hmm. So then we're like, hey, it's great that we have more women here. It's great that we have more, um, more um, people of color. We, have, <coughs> we don't even have a full um, professor who's Latino or Latina. So I, I, I understand your response as a progressive institution that you're doing the work by the numbers game, but what are you doing critically? And I think this year, a lot of students have put in, we're continuing to put pressure on the administration to take a critical look at its internal policies, its internal practices, um, as well as continue to engage what's going on outside the world. 
and that's sort of where we are. So the black tape was like a big thing for like CNN. It was a black tape. It was a big thing for like Harvard for them to go. <gasps> this would never happen here. Like, what is this? Like, we don't have people like this at our school, or this doesn't represent the best of us. So we said that black tape doesn't represent the best of our tradition, but we have a shield that's dedicated to a family who owns slaves. It's like, you can't have both. You can't have both, right? You, you can't have both. Um, and so that's kind of where we are. We just had a meeting on Monday. I didn't make it because I told y'all I haven't been here for like a month. Um, AJ can probably speak to the fruits of that meeting, or maybe not, because we might be planning to shut some shit down. But um, <laughs> if not, um, yeah, he probably shared what came out of that meeting as a result. No, okay, never mind. <laughs> we, we can get more into talking about the responses and how you feel your institutions are 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 not um, being receptive to the kinds of things that you're bringing to the fore. But I wanted to just pick up on. I really appreciate all of you talking about your background and talking about how you viewed your own political. Um, development. And one of the things that um, listening to each person's um, telling of their story raised for me, one of the questions that raised in my mind was I sort of heard a theme of, you know, I find myself at this university at this time, and that's why my activism is here. It was stronger in some people's narrative than others. And so one of the questions that raises for me is, are you protesting what's going on at your schools, your universities, because you have an obligation to protest the world you're part of? Or are you protesting it because you think that higher education plays a special role, or has a special obligation, or, you know, it's, it's particularly important that higher education address these issues of racial justice. I can, I can, I can start. So, so I think, um, so you, your question sort of frames that as an either or, um, but I think it's actually both. Uh -huh. um, so, so like the, the white supremacist sort of power structure that we have to face uh, diffuses power along many different institutional lines um, to sort of <coughs> oppression on certain groups of people, and higher education does have a, a special place um, in in that um, as part of that. Uh, I think, in fact, you might even be able to broaden it towards uh, speaking with respect to curriculum. You could broaden it towards um, education in general, really. Um, just the way that history is taught, in particular, is, is particularly a, a particularly Glaring example, um, you know, coming up through the through the school system, you'd think that uh, essentially what happened is that there was slavery and there wasn't, and then Martin Luther King died on the cross of our racism, and it was gone forever. Um, and that's not how it is in real life, but you wouldn't know that based on what the what the curriculum is, and you don't. Once you get to the at the higher higher at, yeah, institutions of higher education. They perpetuate that. They don't teach. Uh, you have to take an African American studies class to hear about uh, the Black Panthers or the Black Power Movement. You know, and it's yeah, of course, it's, it's certainly not required. And the people that need to hear it, the the you know the white folks who've just been listening to the Martin Luther King version of well, I don't want to say that the you know the false version of history, they're they're never there, and so they don't they don't learn what our experience is. And um, so I think it's I think it's both. And like, and there's like, I believe that college campuses are a reflection of the conditions of the societies that we live in. And so if we're experiencing institutionalized racism and white supremacy on our college campuses, it's only that because white supremacy and institutional racism exists in our society. Um, and you know, being a policy student, I study a lot of um, the school to prison pipeline and my whole um, desire of uplifting low income of color, um, I look at it like how far, how early in the continuum do we disrupt this? Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we, if you look at cases like Meridian, Mississippi, if we're doing the hand thing, how many people have heard of the issues going on in Meridian, Mississippi? So even, even people in my program studying poverty alleviation, 
I have not heard of Meridian, Mississippi, and in Meridian, they have uh, a pending lawsuit because um, in their school district, they have a, an extreme zero tolerance policy, and I want to say it's like upwards of 70% African American. Um, the zero tolerance policies in their schools is even if you're wearing the wrong sock color, um, which is a disciplinary action, you know, you get written off and sent to the principal or whatever, like some warning. Instead of warning, they go straight to jail. They go, they, sent, they get straight to, they get sent straight to the juvenile justice offices. A, a police officer comes and takes these children to, to jail. And then once they get a, one case, they have, um, they're, they're in the system. And so any case that they get after that is an additional time add. And, and this is a system, this is the, the most clearest form of school to prison pipeline where we are creating pathways to prison, not pathways to opportunity, not pathways to education. Um, and if you look at numbers of in, in, our, incarcer in our mass incarceration systems, 75% of people who are incarcerated do not have a high school diploma or a GED. And so there are direct correlations you can draw between education and opportunity, and education and prison, and criminal justice system, and recidivism. Um, and so, you know, knowing all of these, these nice pieces of, of stats, um, you know, my personal experience in coming into grad school, I was shocked to find out how many people in my cohort amongst my peers have had a private school education. Who have had and who are shocked to hear that I've only had a public school education and that my dis like their concept of my being disadvantaged is solely st starts from having just a public school education, not knowing anything else about me. And so that tells me that you know if you somehow fight through all these odds and don't have all these advantages of private school um, tutors, um, living in a, in, a, in, a, in a nice neighborhood, having income in your family, having a dual dual parent household, like all of these things that lead up to being in these institutions, then it's, it's going to be really difficult. But to add to that, um, the people who do make their ways into these institutions are not representative of the whole society. They're representative of a very specific affluent subsect of society, and the, ac the academia, curriculum, faculty, administration, all of that caters to that subset of experience, and that's not reflective of our whole society. And so when people like us somehow break through and come in and feel like we have arrived, um, and then only to learn that they don't, this system wasn't built for us, and what do we do with that information? Do we put our heads down, keep, buying into the system, um, keep vying for that approval, or do we disrupt the system and continuing disrupting this, con this, this continuum, this life cycle continuum, so that we can bust that door open and get as many people into these systems as possible. Mm -hmm. At least that's why I started. When I came to grad school, I had, I'm an activist, I'm an organizer, but I, I came here very, with a very deliberate mindset of not wanting to get into organizing or activism, just wanting to put my head down and work and get out and get back to my community where I wanted to do the real work. And I realized that immediately since the, like from day one when Christian and I met and that, that orientation that this is part of that real work. I don't see anybody, like I saw nobody there that reflected back my experience on any level. And, and how is it that in a policy school for social justice that we want to do this work in underrepresented communities, disadvantaged communities, marginalized communities, communities of color, and there's nobody from those communities there sitting in those rooms. You know? If, if I could add uh, an international context to it as well, coming from development work as well as a, a development program, uh, I think for me that was also that was also a part of it, you know. I'm, I'm, I've traveled. I've been very privileged to travel and um, stepping into a place where they, the idea is that this program um, is putting practitioners out there who are changing the way in which, at least from the Western standpoint, we do development. Right. So the history of Western development is how you colonize folks. So you kind of go in, you tell them that they're doing everything wrong and this is how you do it right, and we spend a lot of money on it, and 
several years later, <coughs> hundreds of years later, we tell the world that we've been spending billions of dollars in this country and nothing has changed. Right. Um, but this program, and I, and I think, again, to its credit, is, is working to change that mindset from the, the students who are American, um, from their per, the, the way in which we're taught to think about development. But what's interesting to me is that when we think about the pedagogy of the classes, right? So you're telling me that you don't want me to think about the West as, as in the West is better than the rest, or the North is better than the South. But every time, for instance, we talk about the Muslim world, the Arab world, we're taking it from the perspective of a white woman in the United States or in, from London, right? So you have, I'm in a classroom learning about development, and the person who I'm learning to think ethically about gender issues in the Arab world is only from the white perspective. And so for me, that's problematic. Uh, when we think about how in these programs, race is not a part of the conversation. It's happening in South Africa. It's been happening in Brazil. It's been happening in the Caribbean. It's been happening in Australia, right? So somehow white supremacy has made it so that even in a program about international development, race is intentionally kept out of the conversation because that's really where the power structure is, is that um, it is in that way in which we keep the conversation about you know, youth development only. And we don't want to focus on the, the ways in which, for instance, South Africa, as she brought up, there's a whole movement going on in South Africa and my professors in the international development program are telling me that race is irrelevant in the international development context. And I just find those types of things to be um, absurd and to be, again, perpetuating this system that um, puts people of color at, in a place where they are devalued and demonized at every at every level of society, internationally and domestically. Um, I just want to one, like just one thing. This is just um, so um, so interesting. So for the last month, um, I've actually been been in Johannesburg and Cape Town, building with students who are part of the role. Rose Must Fall movement, Feeds Must Fall movement, decolonize ECT, a lot of learning from them. And to answer your question that made me much more critical of our student movement, I think that we're so semesteritized, right? Mm -hmm. We feel like, damn, I, gotta, I have to do all this stuff because I'm about to graduate in May. And when I was there, to hear students say, I'm about to get this land back. That's our goal. We need to get this land back. So I understand that I'm a second year student, but my vision transcends my student status. That's the type of organizer that I want to be. Like That's the type of student activist that I want to be. What's the trajectory of this movement? And so I think, I think that the people I'm sitting next to in class, they're going to go on to be prosecutors one day. You know, if another black child is killed and we don't bring charges against that police officer, I would hope that that prosecutor wasn't in a Harvard Law classroom because they've been exposed to the language and the problem. So I, I hope, and this is all like very new for me, like I've only been in class for a week, but that's something I'm sort of bringing back. To what degree is my activism transcending my space and my role as a student? And that's so important. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I've, you know, noticed as I have studied uh, the history of student activism and as I've been watching this current movement take on STEAM and um, take form at one institution after another, that there's often a, um, you know, a point at which activists give the list of demands. And having read a lot of lists of demands, they strike me as, you know, sometimes a really interesting mix of kind of doable things, aspirational things, confrontational things, things that are really like just to make people think, you know, so it's a kind of mix of stuff. And it doesn't necessarily always to me 
add up to necessarily what we really hope our institutions would become. They're, you know, by the very nature of having to list out, they, and so I'm really curious if you could talk a little bit more, if, you know, if you didn't have to be thinking in terms of a list of demands, you really could transform the institutions that you're part of. What would be your vision? What would be your highest priorities in that transformation? I'll take a stab at this. Um, for me, I don't think I can think like that uh -huh. because for me, a list of demands. It, it's not just about what we want to see, it's about being heard. It's about having a voice. At least I know in my experience with Brandeis and Ford Hall, yeah, the list of demands was such a great thing in getting the pledges, but it was about the relationships that was formed in these spaces and that you have to create these spaces for relationships to be formed, to be vulnerable with each other, to say, listen to me, have respect. Like, I shouldn't have to demand respect, and that's what list of demands represent. I'm demanding respect, I want you to hear me, and that's a shame. So therefore, I just personally couldn't answer that question because I can't even think of a world like that because I had to be, um, I had to live in this space for 12 days for someone to respect me, for someone to hear me, and it wasn't just about my experience at Howard, it's about my entire life experience, <coughs> my experience at my undergrad, my experience in high school and elementary and middle school when no one heard me. I was just a little black girl sitting in the corner. Like, and that's a shame. So mm -hmm. for me, it's like, how do you conceptualize that concept? It doesn't exist. So. I think, uh, okay, so I think for a law school, I'm also like stealing all of this language from this very, very powerful student. So we talk about transformation a lot. And students in South Africa are saying, no, we don't want to trans, like, we don't want transformation. We don't want to have this thing and just like make it good and like spray some perfume on it and make it pretty. Like, we don't want that. We need to dismantle, yeah. deconstruct, decolonize. And I think that's a much more radical conversation that people don't want to have because it acknowledges that there was a colonization process. It not so when I think about my property class, how can we trace the entire law of property and not talk about the time where black people were three-fifths of a person and right. sold. Right. How can you talk about property from the beginning of the country and not talk, it's just like, like, hey, uh, <laughs> professor, there was like this one time when you were know, the property, do you remember that? You know, like, what does it mean to acknowledge? In some, in some ways, it feels like intellectual reparations. Because you have to acknowledge and like reconcile it and then figure out a way to like to fix it, to change it. But we just want to say, hey, we're gonna stick with what we have and transform it. Right. And it's like, no, nah, right. like that's not okay. What about all this other stuff that happened to people right. and who are still living with the consequences of those laws, of those policies? What are we gonna do with all of that? We can't pretend like we're starting from ground zero. Right. You know, hegemony works to undo and build up. So it's not that these laws are off the books and everyone's equal. We have to bring people up and dismantle power and bring people down. But we don't want to bring people down. We want to transform and pretend like we can give everyone power. And that's a lie. It's like the concept of demodification. No, I don't want modifications. That's like enough for me. Like, so. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting that you brought that up. Because like, I, 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 I've, been, I've been, like, this. people are going to think I'm a shill for this book, but like, I read Ebony and Ivy uh, over the over winter break about um, about the history of institutions of higher learning, especially the Ivy Leagues like Harvard. Um, and the origin of this place of, of these universities is not it's it's not to educate you. Like I like I want you I want everybody in this room to understand that. That they, they, they didn't build this place initially to teach you anything. They built it as a place to help them colonize the land where it's at. It was used as a school. It was supposed. Harvard originally was an Indian school. It was supposed to be a school to educate the Native American people that they found. And by educate, what they mean is we taught you white English Christian values and sent you back to your community to make them more Christian and therefore, in white terms, more docile. 
That's what it's for. It, it's a little more complicated than that, but there is, <laughs> there's a big element of truth. When you were talking about your property um, class, I was thinking, oh yeah, and I was just reading an article that I, uh, the other day, and it was about um, missionary work towards Native communities in Massachusetts colony, and one of the things that the missionaries had to do was gain property to give Native Americans community. And I'm like, wait a minute, so how did how did this all happen that suddenly all the property was owned and then had to be <laughs> given, <laughs> given back? Um, and yes, that isn't fully talked about, but there is a true, even though it, I think that the people who founded Harvard were very interested in educating young white men for leadership in the colony. It wasn't all about colonizing. Um, well, but what do you mean? What do you mean when you say leadership, though? Yeah. I mean, what were they well, doing? Well, it, it definitely <laughs> was an assumption about a society that they wanted to create. That wasn't a society that believed in the equality of people that every idea was right. It was a certain kind of society. And yes, we don't live in that society anymore. Uh, the society has changed, but those are the roots of our society and the roots of the institutions that we're part of. No, the roots of the trunk, the branches, the yeah. leaves. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> a lot of the protests have been around things that remind us of those roots, and that those roots are still alive as branches and trees. The fruit, so, so mm. it's fruit, it's all of it. So the law school's shield, the name of the Woodrow Wilson School. Could you talk a little bit about how you see these historical markers as related to the kind of new world, not simply transformation and, and beautification of this world. How, how you see the, the, the attention to historical markers as part of that change you want to create? I don't want to, I feel like I'm talking a lot, so I'm going to I, 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 I think that speaks to, never mind, no, no, go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, so I think the, we talked a little bit earlier about how historic, like the history of this country is sort of suppressed or glossed over, and I think part of um, there's a couple there's a couple elements to this. Part of it is you have to bring that history back to life. You have to bring it back to people's attention so that they know, so that they understand the ways in which the, sh the past shaped the way we are now, and it's still shaping the way we are now. Uh, another part of it is personal. These narratives, these these stories about. The institutions that we have and the people in those institutions and what they did, uh, it's, it's a part of how we view ourselves as people, as human beings. And if you don't, if you don't call attention to the historical markers, the, the history of these institutions and, and what, what's been said, part of what you're doing is dehumanizing uh, certain groups of people while allowing other groups of people to retain some semblance of um, supremacy or humanity. And not, and not just that. So the shield was, was adopted in 1936, presumably by an all-white male Harvard corporation. Like, I know that to be true. AJ is like my fact checker, so that's true. Uh, so the process in which the shield was adopted, it's so blatantly racist. It's like, we don't even anticipate this type of student being at this institution who's going to be offended by this shield. Like, like that's what that is. Um, like, and Matt, so how do you guys been following this story in Whitesboro, New York, mm -hmm. with the flag of like the white guy choking? <laughs> a new, okay, so what that is saying is that we don't even anticipate a time where natives will be in a position of power to voice their concern about this flag. When um, Afrikaners took took over certain parts of South Africa, they built the, the the electric grid only to sustain white communities. So they didn't even imagine a time where black people would need electricity. <laughs> like, is that, it's, it's like that same parallel. So when I think about, I don't want to call it historical, because when my professors teach certain lessons, they're teaching 
pretend as if the people in the classroom are not being affected by what they're saying. And what, what they're saying to my peers, it doesn't take into account that they're going to go on and be real lawyers affecting real people. So when you talk about property and you don't talk about this very historical thing that happened, or you don't talk about reparations, or you don't, this is, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm like so excited about this, I can't even like get it all out. So my property professor actually said, you know what, white people weren't the only people to start the fights when they came here. And so I said, uh, <laughs> do you mean that Native people started fighting? <laughs> and I said, yes, exactly. And that's in his textbook. His textbook on page 37 says white people weren't the only ones starting fights. As if it's like, look, guys, we don't want you to think that all the Natives were hostile when we were taking their land away. They actually started some of the fights. So what does it mean as a Harvard Law professor for you to teach a room full of students that history? You're not taking into account my homie Esther, who's, who's Native American. She's like, what? Like, what are you saying right now? So what does it mean for you to be a professor and have this power? You're not taking into account the people who are going to be impacted. It's the same thing with the shield. It's the same thing with the grid. It's the same thing with that, that shield in New York. We're not taking into account the people who are going to be the oppressed communities that they're going to not be oppressed anymore, and they're going to have a voice. Like, this is all the same tree. It's the same orchid, it's the same garden, it's the same hood, it's all the same thing. Sorry, I'm like real hype right now. I don't know why I'm so hyped. So, I'm, I'm curious about how you see yourself as change agents, um, and particularly how you see yourself as change agents now um, when, when you're thinking that what what we're not trying to do is just improve these institutions but like completely rebuild now maybe not everyone on the panel because you know necessarily thinks that's what we're trying to do because we didn't hear from everyone so I don't want to assume everyone thinking in that those terms but so you I'd be interested you know, for people who don't necessarily think it's completely rebuilding, also to speak to this issue. But how do you see the things that you're engaging in now having a, a, a permanent effect in some way in, in, in changing things? Uh, well, I also agree. The whole system has to come down. Uh, I think, and I'll speak to why I believe that, um, because because I it took me it took me twenty five years. Okay. It took me twenty five years. I went to public school. I went to private school. I have a BA. I've traveled. I'm rail read. It took me twenty five years to acknowledge that I am a part and have power and privilege and am a part of oppressing black women. And for me, that means that there is fundamentally something inside of the entire system that cannot be transformed. You have to rebuild it. I, I attend black churches. I've been around black women my entire life. And I keep going back to that because for me, that story is the one that is silenced. Um, and the importance of the work that I'm doing now is is about being self-critical of myself and I expect I am charging white people to do exactly what I am doing I'm not asking them to do anything that I'm not willing to do for my do to myself so when I ask you to instead of immediately critiquing my points to be quiet and listen I am also learning to be quiet and listen, right? When I'm asking you to um, uh, speak to my experience, to value uh, my blackness, I am also learning to value um, black trans women. I am also learning to read um, about the various communities that I intrinsically oppress, right? So for me, 25 years means that like I'm talking about destroying the system because 
It's just fundamentally going to recreate itself all the time. And my community cannot afford for every black male every 25 years to start thinking like this. And for me, that's what it's about. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's kind of what I would say, say to that. So can I just see if I understood? In, in a way, I had asked about theories of change, and in a way, you're talking about theories of change, of your internal change, and you're putting out for other people to also go through their own internal change. Uh, yeah, <coughs> I, I would say that I have gone through my own personal change, and so I don't accept that other people can't go through their own change. It is a personal decision that you continue to make to not make the change. And you are making the daily decision to not be uncomfortable. You are making the daily decision to silence people, to devalue them, to, to silence them. Uh, you are making the daily decision to uh, poison black and brown communities in the United States. You are making it, you are being silent when three black women are getting beat up on a bus in, um, in school. You're being silent when uh, a six-year-old boy in preschool is being kicked out of class because he likes to talk. And he's being put in jail at the age of six because he's a black boy. And you're being silent um, when you hear your fellow teachers talk about how they, how they don't have high expectations for young black boys, for young black girls, for young um, Latino and Latina uh, students in their schools. Like, so for me, it is a decision, and we're all being let off. I have been let off. Again, I'll go back. I'm now 28. So for 25 years, people were letting me off for the things that I was saying when, when my black sisters would talk about their experiences of um, uh, harassment on the streets. I said things like, you need to dress a different way. What did you do, right? And that's also a part of this, that when people come up here and speak, you need to speak about how you did not wake up like this. Right. I did not wake up, was, I was not born woke or whatever people want to call it. I went through this tr personal, internal, crises with myself and it is continuous and it is ongoing and it is hard but I'm not going to stop because I am self-aware and I am willing to do the work and that is what people have to start doing and we can't allow folks to be let off so yes that's what I meant anyone else want to talk about how you see your the things you're engaging in now, the things you plan to engage in as part of a, a, a transformation? Sure, um, I can jump in here. So I, I think that in talking about that continuum that I mentioned earlier, I, I think it was clear for me that dismantling is, is the only approach. And if we're talking about history as like an apolitical thing, then that's assuming that those things that are embedded within our history aren't, um, aren't playing an active role in our present day lived experience. And that's just absolutely not true. And if we're using this, this lovely um, roots example, I can also provide an example. Um, I, I have this beautiful aloe vera plant that I got when I first moved out here like a year and a half ago. And the winter hit, it went into hibernation, and then spring hit, and I watered it like one too many times, and it like slowly started to like implode on me. And I actually took it, I love this plant, so I took it to a plant shop. And I was like, what happened? Please like fix my plant for me. <laughs> they dug it out, and they pulled it out, and they're like, yeah, you have root rot. So because of the root rot, you, you watered it one too many times, the root rot, it is literally exploding because of the, that's like the, the aloe vera, it holds water, but it couldn't hold that much water. So it started to, each, each leaf started one by one explode. And she peeled off the, those dying aloe vera, like those, those dying stems, and was like, maybe it'll survive, do not water it. 
um, let it air out, and you know, let's hope for the best. I aired it out, I put it in the sun, I took as much care of it as I could, it died. And, and it's already died. Um, spoiler alert. <laughs> and and so like you're, you're, when you're talking about roots and we're talking about it, it, it just that that plant immediately came to mind that if the if if something is if rotting from the roots, the whole plant right. is going to die. Right. Yes. And so if if we're talking about this this society rooted in white supremacy, then it is then our society is rotting from the inside out from it. And if we can take it back even further, I'm I'm South Asian and my, my people lived for two hundred years mm -hmm. under British occupation and my father is a survivor of the partition that is like the the biggest mass human displacement in human history. And he was a refugee as a result of that and he he pulled himself out of that only to come to this country where he experienced the same systems of oppression being a, a man of color in this country because he experienced a system of oppression under the British occupation. He moved here and only to find out that anti-black racism is rooted in this country and it impacts all non-black yes. people of color as well. And and so like I, I just don't see how we can divorce history from our present day when it's still actively playing a role because those roots are still rotting. Can I can I also I'm sorry because this is this is kind of you were talking about that social justice thing at your at Harvard and it's like a it's a thing at Brandeis um, it's a thing at Heller and. Uh, I, I was just thinking about both of those contexts, and I was thinking that um, was it last year? I think it was. No, it was like yeah, it was last year over the summer uh, when the when the Muslim couple was it was it was it last summer or was it in South Carolina, North Carolina, yeah, yeah. Charlotte, North Carolina, North Carolina? North Carolina what, what time frame? What time frame was that? A year ago? I think it was last summer. Right? Yeah, yeah, like last, last summer. Right? And yes. talking about this system again, right? It and on a campus about social justice and, and like you know we drink that water and so it's amazing to me that I'm on a campus that is about social justice and while um, xenophobia has been going on for years in the past year we have just seen like this this explosion um, and no one's talking about it on my campus right. no one's talking about it on my campus my school is made up of, I don't know the actual numbers, but I'm just, each program outside of the PhD program, uh, we have a coexistence program that has a large population of, of, of Muslim and Arab students. Our SID program has a large population of Muslim and or Arab students. Um, and it's just our MS program, and like no one's putting out letters of solidarity. Professors aren't talking about it. We got bombings going on at mosques. No one's church. The Christian community is silent. And that, for me, is what we're talking about here, is that the, 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 <coughs> the roots are rotten and the plant is dying, and this is what it looks like, where someone can literally look at your eyes and go, I believe in social justice, and I'm not going to talk about the fact that your people are being murdered. I'm going to look at you and say that I believe in social justice and equity and equality, and I'm literally not going to say a word about the bombings, the firebombs, and the attacks. You, as a Muslim student, could walk out of this building, and someone could kill you. And no one's talking about that. That's insane. And that's why it has to be destroyed, the entire system. Because we're not, we're so, I don't know what it is. I just, I find it amazing. And I'm a part of it, again, as a Christian who has not spoken up enough, who has not stepped in, and who's not, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm going to step up. I'm going to say what I need to say. I'm going to put my body on the line. But these are the types of things, when you're at home, and you're in your organizations, and you're at church, or you're at temple, or you're not you're a non-religious person you should be speaking up and talking about these things because people are this is the experience of people in the world can i add to that story really yes please, please. there was there was a group of students and it was through the 
Color Student Association. It was very official. We we put out a statement oh, about right. the about the the killing of those Muslim students, and the administration refused to let us send it out to to through their listserv. They said Oopsie. to us that we don't put out student statements through our listserv. To which we responded. Here are three different statements that Teller Student Association has put out in the past. Mm -hmm. Put this out. And they refused. They absolutely refused to let us put out. And, and they read it. It was, we stand in solidarity with our Muslim community. And we support them. We denounce acts of Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. They refused to put it out. So, and like, you heard about... Um, that initial orientation that we experienced, and then we 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 flash forward to the uh, occupation of the of the building. But there was a lot of things that happened in between, and this is just one of you know several stories we have like overflowing from our pockets. But and and, and I feel like it's the same narrative on on your campus too that we could spend this whole night on into the morning talking about the microaggressions and overt racism and overt xenophobia that we've experienced as students of color um, on on both of our campuses but I feel like we don't need to prove ourselves in that way I think that they having to having to sit in a cold administration building for two weeks spend our Thanksgiving there contract bronchitis um, and just be subject to um, police threats um, administrative threats, be threatened with legal action, be threatened with being kicked out of school. I feel like the fact that people are willing to put up with that much because of how much they have already been through that they just cannot physically take anymore and they have to take a stand, I feel like that should speak for itself without then having to pull out all the reasons that brought us to that moment. You know, when I'm thinking about all the things that you're doing and you're all involved in activism you're some of you are actively involved in negotiations and meetings and and um, you put it in the context of this long um, series of experiences and at the institution but also living in this world I I want to know about whether you have some optimism about the things that you're that you're currently so <coughs> engaged in, or do you have glimmers of hope about the <coughs> changes you might bring about? Bless you. Thank you. Bless you. Uh, I'll say I will say this: I have hope in my family. Uh, in my community. My family, we, we, those of us who are in Fort Hall, we refer to ourselves as family at this point. Uh, after 12 days of living with people, you pretty much are. Uh, but that's, I, I rest my hope in my community. I, I don't think that you can, let me not say that. I, I that's where my hope is, is that um, we will continue to fight. Um, we will organize, we will create sustainable, means in which to continue organizing. Uh, we will create institutions uh, that, uh, that support student activists inside the university um, so that we can continue to hold them accountable. And for me, that's the only way because when you, when you start to, uh, what did he say? Uh, we had a reverend visit us and he said, when you start to poke the monster, the monster will eventually show itself. And so, we have to keep poking, and um, that's the only way that we're ever, it's ever going to move forward, for me at least. That's, that's where I'm at. My hope lies with, with my community. Uh, I don't want to answer this question, because... You don't have to. I don't know if I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> hope is an interesting word. So I have hope for my hood. Like, I have hope for it. the Fergusons and the Flints and the Baltimores. Because, um, like, just to be honest, when I came to Harvard, it was a huge class shift for me. I don't think most of my peers are from low socioeconomic 
poverty. Like, I don't, they're just not from, they just don't come from places of poverty. That's like, that's the nature of maintaining like a prestigious institution. Um, uh, so when I think about whether or not this shield changes, unfortunately, I think people are gonna graduate in May and like, 